business forecasting and simulation using at risk in the decision tool suite. And this is part one of three parts presented by Glenn Justice of Experience on Demand. My name is Jameson Romeo Hall, and I will be your host today, and I'll be available to help answer technical questions by chat. At this time, all attendees are in a listen-only mode. Please note that as an attendee, you are part of a larger audience today. The attendee list is suppressed to maintain attendee privacy. We will be holding a Q&A session at the conclusion of today's presentation. You may ask an online question anytime throughout the presentation today by clicking on the chat panel. I would also encourage you to visit our website and sign up for a free trial download of our software, including our lead products, At Risk and the Decision Tool Suite. We invite you to sit back and relax and enjoy today's presentation. I would now like to introduce your presenter, Glenn Justice. You now have control. Okay, very good, Jameson. Looks good on my side. And my am, am I up? Yep, looks good. Great, great. Well, thanks very much, uh, and and especially thank you to the audience for joining us today. It's it's, it's a privilege to spend some time with you and present this information. Uh, before we begin, I did I do want to just uh, uh, offer a thanks to the good folks at Palisade. I've had had a great uh, opportunity to get to know them and, and work with them over the course of several years, and and I've had a you know really good experience working with Palisade, and in, and in particular, Jameson. Just wanted to thank you for uh, organizing this and, and helping us uh, get it all set up. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, but before we jump in, uh, just uh, thought I'd open up with a bit of trivia. I am uh, based in St. Louis, Missouri, and, and uh, Jameson and I, we were chatting right before we started about how you know St. Louis is kind of an older city in the country, but certainly has a lot of great things in it. But um, a bit of trivia, in addition to championship baseball, Jameson, uh, what is St. Louis noteworthy for? And I'll give you a clue. Uh, this slide uh, is related to the answer. Oh, I don't know. Uh, you know, you have a you have the uh, the arc. Um, you mean the you mean the arch, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. <the> arch. <laughs> um, okay. Let me think. What else? Uh, I, I guess Mark Twain. Do you want to? Can we? I don't know if we can use the chat feature yet. Can we see if anybody else on? The yes, audience? yes. Let's see. Yes, please feel free to to enter anything into our chat panel, I'll be able to read that off on our side. We'll just give it a couple seconds. Sure. Any responses? No responses. Okay, so uh, St. Louis actually is home of the World Chess Hall of Fame. I didn't know that. Most people don't know that. It's, it's in a little community uh, or a region of, of the city called the Central West End, which is really kind of a hip, trendy uh, place that's a lot of fun to visit. But, but yeah, we have the, the World Chess Hall of Fame, and it's, it's, it's really a, quite a nice place and very fascinating if, if you're all interested in the history of the game. And, and there's a lot of clubs and, and contests that are, uh, that are hosted there, so it's pretty neat. Oh, that's, that's great. We, the one response we did have was the Anheuser-Busch uh, Headquarters. <laughs> that's that's that is true too. So, uh, beer, oh, uh, beer, beer, championship baseball and chess is what we're now known <laughs> for, which is not a horrible thing. So <laughs> that's correct. Uh, well, I didn't know that. that. Will, yeah. Why don't we proceed for sake of time? I do. I am going to move through this material somewhat briskly. I, I want to make sure we leave some time for, for question and answers, just by way of uh, introduction. Um, uh, so I am with a firm called Experience on Demand. We're a small boutique St. Louis-based consulting firm, and our major practice areas really revolve around strategic planning and execution support, economic analysis, process design, supply chain optimization, uh, organizational development, leadership coaching, and training. And we've been around for about uh, seven to eight years and have, have, have had the privilege to serve really a wide variety of organizations. Uh, in terms of my background, I'm not going to uh, go through the tedium of reading, reading my own bio. Most folks have had the opportunity, I think, to, to look at this on the registration site. 
But uh, in summary, I, I basically made my start in simulation modeling early in my career when I worked as an engineer implementing physics-related computer simulations. And uh, over time, I grew to have a, a greater affinity for business and economics than, than engineering, and I moved onto a management consulting path after completing my MBA in addition to study. Um, I've had the good fortune of working with a variety of consulting firms, ranging from very small to very large, including, uh, of course, Deloitte and Touche. Um, and my client base is also very diverse, and it's been a privilege to have uh, the opportunity to help organizations really across a broad spectrum of business types improve their performance. And uh, one of the things I really am passionate about is exploring business challenges and opportunities uh, with numbers and analytics. And so it's, it's, it's fun for me to give this, these, this presentation today. In terms of the uh, agenda, uh, what we wanted to do is first briefly cover our learning objectives to get everybody on the same page as to what we're talking about. And, and really, this is meant to be an introductory uh, webinar. And so if you're experienced in business simulation and Monte Carlo simulation, uh, I think you'll find the vast majority of this information be, uh, to be reviewed for you, uh, but hopefully it will still be beneficial. Uh, we'll talk briefly on the accelerating trend of business analytics. We'll, we'll cover some foundational terminology just to level set and make sure that uh, the audience has, uh, has some level of grounding in some of the terms I'll be using. Uh, the core of today's talk will be really focused around the benefits of advanced business modeling. Uh, and, those, and if there's one thing I want people to you know, walk away with today is the notion that advanced business modeling using Monte Carlo analysis can produce more information and not just more information, but better quality uh, information as well. Uh, we'll talk briefly about the components of the policy decision tool suite, and then we'll wrap up with observations, recommendations, a preview of our second and third web webcasts, and then a Q&A, of course. Our learning objectives today uh, really, in summary, is to establish an introductory level understanding of the trends toward advanced business analytics, foundational terminology relating to Monte Carlo analysis, some of the limitations of deterministic forecasts, and I, I do want to kind of reiterate or, or emphasize that in no way are we saying that deterministic standard models are, are incorrect or, or, or bad. They just tend to be incomplete, and they tend to be sometimes misinterpreted. And tools such as Palisade Decision Tool Suite can really help with that. Uh, as part of that, we'll, of course, talk about the benefits of Monte Carlo-based business simulation, and we'll cover a little bit about the Palisade Decision Tool Suite components. Um, clearly, I think it's common knowledge that uh, with the Internet, there's been this explosion of readily accessible data. And uh, this graph, which is from a website called WorldWideWebSize.com, they, they basically track the size of the World Wide Web. Uh, I'm sure they're, you know, the way it's calculated will produce different kind of results, but it certainly emphasizes the, 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 just the expansive size of the data on the Internet. But this explosion of readily accessible data has, um, has led many organizations to make large investments in advanced analytic capabilities, especially around big data. Just as an example of this, uh, back in June, uh, Ernst & Young uh, had a, a news release where they announced the unification of their advanced analytic capabilities into a global analytics center of excellence. And a lot of the big four firms um, and other large consultancies have these uh, centers of excellence where they really uh, sharply focus on particular capabilities uh, that they want to deploy worldwide. And in this case, uh, Ernst & Young is investing approximately $500 million uh, to further enhance their ability to deliver transformational business analytic services. One of the interesting uh, points and key points that PNY makes in this news release is that it's really about business insight and not the data itself. And I would certainly agree with this. Uh, also, while we clearly see large organizations expand their investments in business analytics, uh, we're also seeing this in smaller organizations where the decisions they make tend to be larger in proportion to their total assets and liquidity position. And what that really means is that, in many cases, smaller organizations are making lumpier, larger, um, you know, bet the farm type of investments as opposed to very, very large corporations where each of their business initiatives or investments may be relatively modest in size compared to their total capitalization. And because of that, the, the importance of getting it right and avoiding mistakes becomes um, 
magnified in importance for smaller organizations. And so um, one of the things that we enjoy is really finding ways to help smaller companies apply these types of higher end capabilities. Um, some of the types of uh, analytics or forms of analytics, um, of course, this can be described in different ways, but what I tend to think of are these four main categories. First, diagnostic or descriptive analytics, which really amounts to analyzing, slicing, and dicing historical data, as well as metadata or data about data, to gain insight into past performance. Then we have predictive analytics, which is, as the name would imply, projecting future performance based on statistical analysis of trends, correlations, and relationships with key drivers. We have then uh, risk-focused analytics, which uh, really then revolves around assessing potential performance and performance uncertainty with a particular focus on unrewarded or organizationally sensitive risks. And then lastly, what I put in the uh, optimization analytics uh, category, first and foremost is, is, is quite simply kind of finding that a sweet spot for major decisions. So what is my optimal point for pricing my product? Or what is my optimal investment in, uh, in production capacity that balances revenue and costs and risk? Um, but also, it's about uh, using the power of data integration across the enterprise to analyze the business and identify unique value creation strategies holistically, as well as treating risk in an opportunistic fashion. So these are the four main categories of analytics that, uh, that I like to think about. And really the big data and, 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 and uh, internet-driven explosion of analytics is, is predominantly focused in just that first part of it. Uh, you know, more and more applications and uh, capabilities are available to people to slice and dice data, to look at historical information. But it really takes that plus business insight and the ability to understand what the data means to transition in predictive risk management and optimization related uh, analytic uh, uh, benefits for an organization. Now we're going to sh uh, shift a little bit towards some of the foundational terminology. I just wanted to cover a couple concepts uh, quickly here, again, just to level set and make sure we have a, a common understanding of the way uh, I happen to be using the terminology today. Uh, first of all is this notion of a deterministic model. And what this really means uh, is conventional models, typically spreadsheets, where a single set of static values are combined with formulas to produce a single set of static results. So you know, basically, it's a standard spreadsheet model. Uh, a kind of a snippet of a sample one is shown here below. Uh, and of course, most organizations will, uh, you know, will uh, be alternative what-if scenarios by uh, by you know, by changing some of the inputs individually or in groups to look at the range of results. But that's what we mean by a deterministic model. We uh, contrast that with Monte Carlo simulation, which is running a model many times in the session. And again, this tends to be a spreadsheet type model, although there are other applications that aren't necessarily spreadsheet based. But um, you know, running the model many times in succession, typically using an automated process where, with a large collection of random draws of inputs so that you can produce and examine the probability distribution of the results. And what happens is that after each run, uh, the key results are recorded. And after the model is run a selected number of times, it could be 100,000 or maybe 10,000 times, the results are gathered and presented in a probability distribution along with uh, noteworthy statistics. And we'll, of course, be showing more of these later in the webcast. Uh, probability distributions. This is a, a, a central part of Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, but it's basically just looking at how are the results of a random set or a large set of trials, how are they distributed? And here what we have is the classical example of if you take two, two dice, uh, each, of, each having the numbers 1 through 6, and you roll them. In this case, we rolled, rolled the dice 36 times. Um, as most people know, um, there's only one way you can get the answer to, which is two uh, ones. There's only one way you can get the answer 12, which is two sixes. But there's an increasing number of ways to get the numbers uh, you know, four, five, six, uh, and so forth. And so what happens is you have a relatively larger proportion of the outcomes grouped uh, around the outcome of seven um, when you roll the dice. Now you can apply the same, uh, and, and by the way, what we have here 
is we have the different possible outputs or results at the bottom, namely 2 through 12. We have on the left axis the number of possibilities out of 36 that occurs in each case. So in this case, the number 2 might have come up one time, the number 12 might have come up one time, up to the number 7 coming up an average of maybe six times. And then we have the probability of each role expressed as a percentage on the right-hand column. So this is just one way of describing a probability distribution. Here's another example where what I've done is simply taking the data from historical inflation. And I've simply um, analyzed the year-to-year -year change in the consumer price index. I've changed that to a percent to reflect uh, an inflation rate. And you, as you can see here, the vast majority of the years, the level of inflation is right in this range between 0 and 0 0.05, which would be 5% in this case. And as most people know, inflation typically is thought to average around you know, 25 to 3%, which is exactly what the data uh, indicates. But of course, you have these outliers where you may have a deflationary period where prices uh, fell by 10%. Uh, or, of course, periods where the annual uh, inflation might have been uh, as high or higher than, let's say, 15%. But again, this is an example of a probability distribution. Another term we want to talk about is the notion of mode, mean, and median. And here we have three, uh, three examples of probability distribution shapes. And what we want to highlight here is that we have three primary statistics we tend to look at, the mean, the median, and the mode. The mode is simply the most likely outcome of the distribution, and it correlates with the highest point on the probability distribution. So what is the, the most frequent result that occurs? The median is the point at which half of the results are below and half of, half of the results are above the given, the given value that is the median. Or, uh, yes, excuse me. And the mean reflects the average of, of all the results. Now, in what's called a standard normal distribution that's not skewed here, you can see it's symmetric on both sides, the mean, median, and mode are the same value. When we have a positively skewed distribution uh, like this, um, the, the mode is here, the median and in particular, the mean tends to be stretched out to the right. And these other uh, statistics reflect the fact that you can have these very high values that may have low probability, but the large value uh, tends to skew the median and the mean, and the, and the mean uh, to a level that's uh, above the mode. And uh, similarly, for a negatively skewed distribution, you have just the opposite. But the key takeaway here is that the average of the distribution can be considerably higher than the most likely outcome of the distribution. We all also have the factor called correlation, which is simply the degree by which two variables tend to move together. Uh, this graphic represents a, an example of um, ice cream sales uh, based on uh, outside temperature. And as you can see during uh, this portion of the temperature range, uh, sales of ice cream uh, rises with hotter and hotter temperatures. But you get to a point where it gets so hot outside, people just aren't going anywhere. And so this range of the graphic represents positive correlation, whereas temperature goes up, sales of ice cream also go up. But then you get to a point where you have the opposite, where sales of ice cream start to actually fall as temperature gets even higher. So those are some of the key business terms that, that I wanted to focus on. Now, as we get into the, 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 the crux of this webinar, um, what we really want to talk about is, is this notion of why and how business modeling using Monte Carlo techniques can provide both more and better decision support information. And as I, as I alluded to earlier when we had the, 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 uh, the slide with the news released from Ernst & Young, it's really about the business and the information needing, needed to support the business, not just the data and the analysis. In terms of more information, uh, the things that we, we, we get out of Monte Carlo simulation include things like how well or poorly might my business perform? What are the most important drivers of the business? When might I, might I expect to cash flow positive? Uh, how might or how much cash might I need from a total capitalization perspective for the business? Uh, 
uh, and so forth. These are all the kinds of additional insights that you, you can gain in a much more convenient way than traditional spreadsheets by using uh, simulation tools. And what I want to dive into now would be a simple example. And, and I, I imagine that we have this hypothetical widget production line. And so suppose that we have um, $5,000 per month of fixed costs. We have um, historical per unit production costs that are variable of 20 pounds of material X, 10 pounds of material Y, and $200 of labor. So these are the things that are required on a variable basis to produce each, each unit. We have production capacity of 10,000 units per month, and our minimum production level is 1,000 units per month. So let's say the current market prices uh, are as follows for material A, B, and the actual uh, widget sales price, namely $30, uh, $50, and $1,400. The question becomes, well, what is the expected value of this production cost? Um, and what, what I've done on the right here is basically encapsulated these factors into an equation where our monthly profit, of course, equals our monthly quantity times the difference between the sales price and the variable price of producing the unit minus the $5,000 of fixed costs on a monthly basis. And then this is reflected in, in this spreadsheet. And what I'll also do here quickly is bounce over to, uh, here's my Excel spreadsheet where I've loaded in at risk, but here's the same information, and I'll be, be going back to this to run the simulation momentarily. Um, but what we, what we have is um, calculated for each month uh, the market prices for each component, the, the widgets for the sales price, the cost of material A and B. Uh, that produces a unit cost of $1,300 uh, per unit when you, when you uh, include the labor. Um, that uh, unit cost is lower than the sales price, which would imply that we should operate the production line. And so our production for that month will be the 10,000 maximum capacity units. That produces revenue of $14 million. The variable cost, of course, is $13 million. The fixed cost is $5,000, which produces a profit of $995,000 uh, in this simple example. Uh, when you add all that up, the total profit for the year uh, in this simple example would be $11.9 million. And that's, of course, highlighted again back here on this slide. Now, what I'm referring to here is, is really what a conventional spreadsheet model might look, look like, uh, this type of analysis. Um, and, of course, what would, um, pardon me, what might typically be done is to do what analysis around, in this case, the market prices to look at, well, you know, how, uh, how high or how low might profit be under different uh, assumed inputs. Now, this what-if analysis is, is, of course, useful, but it really tells us very little about what to actually expect. Well, by applying the capabilities of the sim simulation model, such as at risk, um, we can provide much richer information. So suppose we know a bit more about market prices, namely um, historically prices for material material A tend to vary by around 10%. Prices for material B tend to vary by around 20%. And the uh, market price for widgets tend to vary also around 10%. Um, at risk gives us a very convenient way to incorporate this as well as other in additional information, for example, correlation information. But conversely, doing so in a conventional spreadsheet is really is really pretty uh, difficult. It, it, it certainly can be done, and we can provide examples of how to do it. But it is uh, somewhat laborious to uh, to factor these uh, these these pieces of information into a traditional spreadsheet. So what I'm going to do here is flip back over to my my spreadsheet. And like I mentioned before, I have um, taken this and modeled it with at risk. What you'll see here quickly, and what I'm not going to do is belabor how to apply at risk because there's, there's an abundance of tutorials and other uh, training materials uh, uh, through Palisade on this. But roughly what we're doing is, is defining probability distributions around these key inputs. 
in this case of, of applied what's referred to as a log, log normal or a skewed to the right distribution for these, which is typical for market prices. Uh, in other words, market prices can't really go below zero typically, but they can go quite high, uh, theoretically uh, approaching infinity. Uh, and so I've reflected these distributions here. And actually what I'll do is I'll show you an example of this one for the widgets by clicking on the spine distribution. Uh, graphic. And then what we'll do is I'll run the simulation here. In this case, I'm going to run it 10,000 iterations. Uh, that way, I have a nice smooth probability distribution. And so we then get this nice uh, output of the results. And what you can see here is we have some basic statistics, the minimum and maximum value of the, of the simulation. We have the average or mean, the mode, the median, the standard deviation of the results. Uh, and then we also have this nice uh, uh, integrated function where we get the, the cumulative distribution at various levels of result, which shows um, how much we can expect to make in the way of profit at various uh, total probability levels. Um, so um, going back to the PowerPoint, uh, this is the same graphic. And what you'll notice here when I run the distribution is that you have uh, you have a a, uh, a most likely value calculated as 12.5 million, a uh, mean value of 15.5 million. Uh, again, these various statistics that uh, at risk provides, uh, and then we have over here the deterministic value 11.9 million, and we'll come to come back to that uh, momentarily. But certainly, this is much richer information than you would be able to obtain uh, with any degree of convenience in the regular spreadsheet model. Well, what, at, what else can at risk tell us? Well, what I've done in at risk, um, going back to um, the spreadsheet, I've defined additional additional outputs. One of the things you do in at risk is you define which parameters you want to study from the simulation. What I've also done is looked at, well, how often does my plant operate? And so I can go back and browse my results, and here's an example of additional information that at risk can tell me. On average, the plant will operate approximately 70%, which is great information from a uh, operational planning perspective and from a supply chain management perspective. You, of course, have uh, certain scenarios where the input prices are high enough combined with low sales prices where you choose not to operate the production line. Uh, and then certain times where you operate it nearly continuously, and these will, of course, be scenarios where your uh, variable costs are low and your sales prices are high, and you're making quite a bit of profit per unit produced. Uh, another example of uh, what I can tell you is um, what are the most uh, important variables, or what are the key drivers to profitability? And in this case, uh, what we're looking at is what's commonly referred to as a tornado diagram, where what's happening is that at risk is automatically doing what if analysis for you uh, across different variables that are defined in the model. In this case, uh, I've, I've uh, modeled uh, widget sales prices, prices of material B, prices of material A. And what you can see here is the, the biggest driver are the prices of the widgets, secondly, the price of material B, and thirdly, the price of material A. So that would imply, I might want to think from a managerial perspective, how do I really give additional focus to, let's say, increasing marketing activities, uh, improving uh, perceived customer value, doing things uh, that are possible to increase sales price, while also driving perhaps down uh, the price of material E. These are just a few of the additional outputs you can get from uh, at risk and uh, other tools within the decision tools suite. 
Uh, now I want to shift gears to the second notion of better information. I, I think everybody would, would agree that by applying these tools, you, you, you can obtain more information and gain greater insight into the potential performance of the business. But it's important to notice the following. As I alluded to a moment ago, the deterministic profit value from the conventional spreadsheet is $11.9 million. Uh, but the most likely value is actually $12.5 million. And most importantly, the mean or expected value, which is also the average value, is actually $15.5 million. Now, this is 30% higher than the deterministic value, which is what you would typically get from a flat spreadsheet. And, and most people, of course, know that, of course, the plant will run during different uh, you know, pricing scenarios and that you might have upward opportunity for the business, but with that risk, you can quantify that explicitly and really begin to study it, and study it in a convenient way. Um, and from my perspective, that 30% difference is very significant, and if I were making this investment, I would certainly want to know that, as well as some of the other parameters uh, that at-risk can tell us. But the question becomes, well, wh why the difference? Well, this difference uh, is really related to uh, this mathematical law, which is known as Jensen's inequality. And the differences can be either small or large. And I'll cover this briefly. So um, in math terms, uh, and this is my, I guess, my heavy equation slide, uh, Jensen's inequality uh, states that the expected value of a function of variables is equal to or greater than the function's value of the variable's expected value assuming the function is convex. And the opposite turns out to be true if the function, in this case the function is, uh, is uh, will be referred to as, as psi, that's the Greek uh, uh, term here, uh, is if that is concave, the opposite is true. Now graphically, what this means is that if you have business or any kind of um, set of variables or functions that are nonlinear, in this case they're kind of increasing, exponentially as x increases, the expected value will tend to be greater than the deterministic value. And this will uh, always be the case if you have these nonlinearities and these exponential behaviors in the business. The, the crux of this, uh, this fact uh, really uh, means the deterministic business models, they tend to distort the true expected value of many businesses. And this distortion, though, can reflect either undervaluation or overvaluation, depending on the business and its key drivers. Also, the degree of distortion can vary from negligible to significant, again, depending on the business and its key drivers. But in most cases, and I think in the case uh, of our hypothetical example, the differences are worth analyzing and understanding. Now, I wanted to reiterate this does not mean that deterministic models are inherently incorrect, but they do tend to be incomplete and misinterpreted. And businesses that stop at producing uh, deterministic models, and they stop doing what-if analysis and don't continue uh, through with some level of business simulation, they tend to be uh, at risk of uh, incurring losses or opportunity costs uh, driven by uh, these distortions. And clearly, um, tools such as Palisade's decision tool suite can be tremendously helpful in filling this gap. In terms of the different components of decision tool suite, um, at risk, which is the flagship product uh, within the suite that uh, performs Monte Carlo simulations on Excel-based operational and financial models. Uh, there's also some other very valuable and interesting components, though. Uh, the, my next two favorites that I tend to use would be Precision Tree, which helps frame and analyze complex sequential decisions using decision tree analysis. And what I think is really interesting is that these components can be integrated so that you can actually embed uh, at, at risk capabilities within your precision tree analyses and come up with very rich decision analysis uh, uh, capabilities. Uh, the next one that I personally tend to use is called Top Rank. Now, uh, my understanding is that Top Rank isn't necessarily uh, offered uh, in a standalone version by Palisade, but it is uh, embedded in some of the other tools and part of the, uh, the decision tool suite. But what it does, uh, like we showed the tornado diagram earlier, it basically helps you identify in an automated and very uh, rich fashion 
the critical factors in the model and then ranking them by impact on results. Uh, and so this tends to be a very nice augment to manual what-if analysis to help you hone in on the, the factors in your uh, your business or in your model that really need to be most closely uh, paid attention to. Uh, that is more what I would describe as specialty tools. You have neural tools, which is uh, which basically is a tool that automates the analysis of data and time uh, series data in particular is a good example of this to make intelligent data-driven forecasts. Uh, Stat tools is a toolkit that automatically slices and dices data and creates associated data statistics. And then Evolver uh, is a tool which helps you um, analyze sets of inputs which produce the best results in a, within a set of defined constraints. So, but what this means is that most businesses and most models really have certain constraints around the operating parameters or the input parameters. And by applying Evolver, you can look at what is that sweet spot of, of my operational decisions. So uh, as we begin to wrap up, and again, I wanted to offer some uh, time for questions and answers. Uh, in terms of observations, uh, in, in my mind, business modeling and analytics using Monte Carlo te techniques will, at a minimum, provide valuable additional information about the expected and potential performance of really any kind of business. And this information can lead to new insights and better, faster decisions. In many cases, these techniques will also produce higher quality and, in my mind, more dependable information. And what I mean here is that in these cases where um, the, the simulation values tend to be quite a bit different than the deterministic values. Uh, you're really improving the quality of your information because in most cases, you're going to want to make business decisions based on uh, averages or mean values and not just most likely values. It turns out that businesses that tend to benefit from simulation modeling tend to have one or more of the following characteristics. They have some degree of flexibility or optionality in the business. They have operational or financial characteristics that are nonlinear or asymmetric. Um, and they have key drivers that are positively or negatively correlated. And in these last two bullet points, uh, in terms of the, the nonlinear or asymmetric operational parameters, um, the example of the, um, the, uh, the, the hypothetical uh, widget production line, which we talked about today, is an example of that, where it has a floor on its capacity output of 1,000 widgets per month. It also has a maximum level of output. And these things tend to uh, create these nonlinearities, which are really important to analyze from a, a simulation perspective. Um, they also have key drivers that are positively or negatively correlated, which in many cases, uh, prices or price-related input, in inputs tend to be uh, correlated. And again, in either positive or negative directions. And it's important to at least analyze whether your business has these uh, attributes uh, using decision tools. In terms of recommendations, what I would say is that regardless of whether your business is small or large, for profit, not profit, or somewhere in between, such as a social enterprise business, uh, we, we really do recommend the following. First of all, if you're already applying business simulation techniques, uh, it's always good to consider evaluating the quality of your simulations and inputs. And in particular, consider the impact of other uncertainties, especially event risk. Uh, it's very common, and I see this in, uh, in my experience practicing risk management, where you have other forms of risk and you have always the possibility of scenarios that are far worse than what the historical data may have indicated. And you have to be careful not to uh, create a false sense of security in terms of how high or how uh, low performance might be. And, and, and this especially occurs with event risk type scenarios, which, uh, which can be more challenging to model uh, using simulation tools. Um, I would also recommend that you consider harnessing uh, the flexibility uh, and, 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 and risk, uh, or excuse me, to consider the next step of harnessing flexibility and risk in an opportunistic fashion. And what, I, what I mean by this is that uh, risk and volatility actually creates opportunity if you can create flexibility in your business and begin to plan to use that flexibility in a better way than your competitors. And what it does then is creates opportunities where you can capture um, events that happen to pop up or opportunities that pop up unexpectedly better than uh, other firms. 
Now, if you're not yet applying business simulation techniques, uh, we would we would uh, recommend you consider evaluating the quality of your current modeling approach and inputs, and also ask those uh, who rely on your business analyses what types of more or better information might be valuable, as well as how it might be valuable. Uh, I think by asking the question how or why really gives you an opportunity to understand the context of of why of how the information is used and really. Um, how you prepare for the managerial steps of applying that uh, new information opportunistically. And then, um, of course, uh, I think with, with the free trials and other uh, other features and benefits that Palisade offers, uh, I certainly think uh, the Decision Tool Suite is a great option to consider testing uh, to gauge its potential value to your organization by applying it to a few sample analysis that you may uh, commonly perform. In terms of what's next, I just wanted to uh, provide a brief preview of the second and third webcast. So the second webcast, which will be held on Thursday, August 14th, will involve a deeper dive into modeling with at-risk. So we'll, we'll unwrap uh, some more of its features and showcase those. Uh, in particular, what we'll want to cover is to uh, clarify the differences, as well as how Monte Carlo analysis fits with what-if analysis, scenario analysis, and stress testing. It's really interesting. I've, I've gotten into the debate with a lot of different people over the years, both within consulting and in industry, is you know, what's the difference of applying simulation compared to just doing what-if analysis and scenario analysis? And actually, there's some very rich and valuable uh, interconnections between these, and I wanted to uh, uh, describe those and showcase those in the second webcast. We'll also um, describe and give examples of how to apply at risk uh, for discrete risks, including event risks, as well as project risks, uh, showing the functionality of using at risk uh, with Microsoft Project. Uh, the third webcast, which is Thursday, September 18th, will have a case study from a real company. Uh, and uh, we'll also cover issues and lessons learned in implementing advanced analytics in small and large company settings. One of the things I also like to do is share different references that I found to be particularly valuable. And these are three of, of my top 10 uh, reference texts for, for business. Um, these, uh, some of these are older texts, but I find them to be very valuable. This first one is really more of a mathematical treatment of how you really think about making large investments under conditions of uncertainty. And uh, it's, it's, of course, a kind of a math-heavy book, but provides a lot of great uh, example of the the equations and the, the theory behind investment under uncertainty. The second book gives a great treatment of how to actually apply computational techniques to analyze real options. And most every business contains various forms of real options, which can create a significant competitive advantage if you analyze those options and you learn to leverage them. And then lastly, this last one came from a, a course I took up at Wharton, uh, which uh, was, a, was a great opportunity to learn how to apply risk analysis and to think about uh, volatility and uncertainty opportunistically and to, to move through a process which they refer to as opportunity engineering. So I would highly recommend these references for those that might have the time to start them. Lastly, I wanted to offer a concluding thought. Um, I wanted to reiterate the fact that, or the notion that it's not about the analysis, it's not about the data, it's really about business insights. And in my experience working with a diverse collection of clients, a uh, successful business really is composed of these components. First and foremost, a good strategy, well executed. Of course, sufficient capital uh, supporting the business. Uh, all businesses benefit from having, I think, a relentless customer focus. Um, you, you can't underestimate the importance of the customer in any business. But in addition to that, thinking how to position and executing your strategies so that you position for opportunities that pop up unexpectedly. And that really relates to this concept of being business and agile, or being nimble and, ag and agile uh, in your business. Uh, avoiding major mistakes is, of course, very important. And that, uh, that connects with the topic of risk analysis. And then, first, and, and then lastly, continuous improvement. All successful businesses uh, seem to have this culture of continuous improvement. And, and I believe tools such as uh, Monte Carlo Simulation and the Palisade Decision Tool Suite really can help with all of these areas and improve their quality to promote greater business success. 
here's my contact information. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to uh, interact with any of you uh, with just Q&A on your particular business issues. Um, and then lastly, I want to thank all of you for your participation and your time. Uh, it's, been, uh, it's been a privilege to present this information, and, and I appreciate the, the time everyone has taken to attend. Well, thank you, Hopefully. Glenn. This, this was a very clear overview, and we really appreciate this. That well, why don't we why don't we open things up uh, yes. for uh, for questions and uh, and then we can uh, wrap up. Let's see what we have here. I'm going to check. Great. Uh, one of our first questions is: uh, Will the uh, uh, spreadsheet and the PowerPoint uh, PDF of the PowerPoint be available to the attendees? Uh, we can we can certainly make that available. What I would ask is that uh, I, I prefer not to just just uh, uh, broadcast it, but people are welcome to email me, and I will be happy to uh, send that to them. Perfect. And another question is: Can you provide some insight how to relate mean capacity utilization of seventy percent to mean value of fifteen million profit, which is higher than static value? Right. Well, you can sure, and 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 um, one of the interesting things that we found is that that you can have this this um, very asymmetric behavior between profit and operational capacity. And and, and I hope I'm getting at the uh, the question here. But if you think about this, let's imagine a scenario where um, where um, the business. Uh, is right at that edge of being profitable, and, and what I say profitable on a variable cost basis. So you're producing that first dollar of gross margin, uh, and you of course have your fixed costs which are sunk. You can have a scenario where the oper where, the, where the production line operates at 100% capacity, but if your if your gross margin just equals your fixed costs, your profit will be zero, even if you're operating the plant or the production line at 100%. Or if you if you go just check just below that, where your variable cost is just a dollar below, uh, or excuse me, just a dollar above the um, the sales price of your units, in that case you would rationally not operate your, your production line at all. Um, in this case, I'm ignoring the minimum capacity output, um, and yet your profit would also be right at zero. And so you can have this nonlinear behavior with um, with uh, with, with um, operations and profit. And um, interestingly, this kind of tool is what actually gives you the best ability to explore that behavior. Well, good. <laughs> Thank you. I think I, uh, I think our attendee, that, that made sense. Yeah. He, he, he may reach out to you with more questions. Sure, sure. Basically, sure. you get to the situation of, of higher and higher output, but you reach your, your kind of point of maximum capacity, but your prices can, can continue to go up um, uh, of your, um, your sales price. And of course, your, your input um, prices as well. But, but the very nature of this is you have this nonlinear behavior between profit and uh, operating production. And that's exactly why it's, it's very valuable to apply simulation tools because um, because if you're not careful, deterministic spreadsheets can give you a false sense of really what will my production my production be uh, in relation to my profitability. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, I would be happy to follow up with uh, any anybody on that uh, that idea. Oh, great, perfect. Would oh we uh, the uh, would you be able to show your email spreadsheet again? I mean your email slide. Absolutely. Yeah. We'll, we'll just leave that up for. Oh, and a, another question is: Will we have this recording on on our website? We will. I'll send out a reminder, follow up email, perhaps today or early tomorrow, and that'll have a link that'll direct you to where you can find the recording. Uh, let's see. We have a couple.
right, we might have a few more questions that may end up following up with you, Glenn. That's, that's uh, perfectly great. Um, what, especially, we, oh, go, go ahead, sorry about that. Sure, sure. One of the things that we didn't touch on yet, but we, we probably should, um, uh, while we're waiting for any other questions to um, to accumulate that we want to handle live here, is that we did, uh, I think on the webcast uh, invitation, we are going to be conducting a drawing after each webcast. Um, uh, of course, we're going to, we, we want to protect people's anonymity. Um, I think it's important to do that this day and age. But Jameson, I think, uh, as you and I talked about when we prepared for this, uh, I believe you guys are going to be, be randomly drawing the name of uh, a primary and a backup uh, attendee today. And uh, we'll be reaching out uh, uh, through you, if that's OK, uh, sure. to see if your organization is interested in a complementary analysis using uh, Decision Tool Suite. So we'll, we will be doing that today. And hopefully, uh, that's that's of interest to folks. Yes, that would be great. Well, maybe maybe we'll let's see. I do have one something about what's coming up. Will we be later shown how to use the Palisade tools to perform simulations based on integration of models for scenario? stress testing and optimization? Um, the answer to that is, is yes. Um, certainly on the first part of that, um, the, the notion of stress testing, uh, as I alluded to, in the second webcast we'll be covering, you know, what is stress testing, how does it, how is it applied, and, and what are the distinctions between, a, you know, performing stress testing uh, in a simulation environment compared to doing it in a flat spreadsheet. And um, the, the, the two are, of course, related, but it's important to understand how the two blend together. And, and what, I, what I believe is that if you're going to apply stress testing, you're actually better off doing it on top of a simulation model as opposed to just taking a flat spreadsheet and, and putting extreme values in that, in that flat spreadsheet. Uh, and we'll, we'll be covering that in the second webcast. In terms of optimization, um, um, depending on how the timing works out, uh, my hope is to include an example of, of how um, uh, Evolver would be used and how you would use it to, um, you know, find an optimal uh, decision point for for a model. Great. Well, I bet you, I bet you, you're going to be hearing more. And if, if anybody has any questions later, feel free to email me also. I'll be sending up a follow-up email too soon. And if you're watching this recording sometime in the future and have any questions, certainly reach out to us. And, and uh, Glenn, I'm really looking forward to part two and three. Great. Well, thanks, thanks again, uh, Jameson. Thank, thanks. To Palisade and, and and thanks to all the attendees who took some time to participate today. We we appreciate your time. Yes, we sh we sure do. And thank you, Glenn. All right, and we'll and we'll Have be talking day. soon. Have a good day. Yeah, you too. Thanks.